What's up, everybody? It's Nika Simone. I'm here for another episode of Welcome to My House for Comedy Hype. And we are here with Atlanta, born and raised, now in and out of, now Indianapolis. Yes. Miss Comedian Pat. Miss <laughs> Pat. Hi, thank you for having me. Oh my gosh. Your story is crazy. Do you ever <laughs> look back like and think, I can't believe that really happened in my life? Those, like all that you've gone through? Uh, yes. A lot of times, you know, at first I thought it was normal. I'm from the inner city of Atlanta, so, you know, I thought everybody lost a nip in a drive-by, right. had a baby, had a teenager, had a couple of STDs and everything else. But then I got into the real world, like, hey, everybody didn't go through what I went through. So right. I look back sometimes and, um, and I go, wow, I don't know how I got through that. I don't know how. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how to hear, like, two kids by 15. Two kids? By the time I was 15, by a married man. Who, uh, granddaddy ran a, ran a small business? Yeah. Bootleg? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, um, my grandfather had a bootleg house in the, uh, in Atlanta also. That's where it all started. Okay. That's the first entrepreneur I ever saw in my life was my grandfather. He sold moonshine. <laughs> and <laughs> he was, I don't understand why his customers kept coming back. Because he beat their ass every day. He really? would just throw them out the stream though. And once he throw them out, he come back and nail it up. I'm like, why are you going to nail it up? You're going to throw somebody else back out the door anyway. <laughs> so <laughs> he's going to throw them out the door all the time, beat up all his customers. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And that was so your that was your first introduction to an entrepreneur entrepreneurship. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My grandfather. I I saw like the the struggle with your mom. Yeah. And was she um, having you like pick pockets? Yeah. She saw. That was, I always tell people that was my first job. I would pick pick the drunk people pockets on the weekend, and for every wallet she gave me a dollar, and then I think it got up to five dollars, and it was a lot of money for. I think it was about eight. So was it depending on how much you picked no, pocketed? No, whatever wallet I got, if it, if it was enough, it was a dollar in there, she would give me a dollar. It wasn't bad. I mean, Pat Man was a quarter. Yeah, All I needed was now they did Laffy so. Taffy. Oh, I know. I was balling. I was just talking <laughs> the other day. I was in Thrifty's getting some ice cream, and the, the, the guy behind me and his family, he was like, I remember when ice cream was 25 cents. I was like, do I? <laughs> <laughs> so I know it used to be cheap, you know. At least you can you, you can take a quarter and, and get somewhere with some can little dollar candies and things like that. Five dollar candies. You can five five cent candies. I remember one time I pulled up in the hood. I was like, "Hey, go knock on that man door and give you a quarter." And the little boy was like, "A quarter? I shoot you!" <laughs> <laughs> Y'all don't run errands for quarters anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's when I realized times had, had really changed when you can't get a kid to move for a quarter. Oh, my god! My kids be like, I'd do it for $10. I'd do it for $20. Mm-hmm. We didn't even know what a $20 bill was. Man, you know what I mean? People are raw for a dollar at a time. Which, was there ever a time that you got caught? Nah. Like, what, what really? No. Nah. Uh, she, well, she was. She taught me how to be smooth with it. Uh-huh. <laughs> so no, nah, and she, you know, she knew how who would wake up and how much they drank. So no, nah, I never got caught. I hated doing it. Mm. You know, I was hoping if I did it, they would they would stop coming to our house. But it's like the more I stole from them, the more they kept coming back. Mm. Didn't even rec- notice it gone. Well, it was drunk off a of, off a of, uh, corn liquor. That stuff is made. Ain't no telling what's in that crap. <laughs> So was stronger than gin and juice. So that was your first job, pick, pickpocket in the drunks at Granddaddy's. Mm-hmm. Um, how does it in turn to getting your nipple shot off? Um, like, shot, like for one, you you put it in your comedy and you, you make it funny. But in, in my mind, I'm I'm holding my titties, listening to you <laughs> say these stories. Like it it was blown off. Uh, it went up under my arm and. Uh, it came out through my areola, so your nip is connected to your areola. It's still there, it's a little raggedy. And uh, I just make a joke, I said, you don't need two nipples, they're overrated. Nobody's gonna use both of them, you know. Hey, <laughs> just stay to the left, that's uh-huh. what I tell my husband. It was a, a drug dealer, um, he shot me. I was shooting at him and he shot me, hit me up on the arm, and it damaged my nipple. Oh my and gosh. I just found a way to make it funny. But that's my comedy. I found a way to make all things that some people wouldn't think is funny. You know, dark, crazy stories yeah. that happened in my life. 
I I was I mean I, I hear you tell the joke about being with the nipple being shot up, but you also talk about being shot in the head. My kid's father. Yeah. So please. It cracked my skull. I mean, it didn't go through like I, I don't know. It, it just cracked my <laughs> skull. It, it, oh my gosh! <laughs> it cracked my skull. It was never. It left a nice hole back there. And you want to hear something crazy? This is how ghetto I was. So after I get out, they, they you know they tell me they cracked my skull and it didn't go in and all that. So me and my girlfriend's going to the club. They like, you can't go to the club. I was like, uh huh. So they don't shade all around the gunshot wound. Girl, my other friend fixed her. She finger wave around that gunshot wound. <laughs> And baby, I had a little napkin back there, and we went out and we parted up some. We parted up some. We you heard? Back of my head, Nikki, my friend. Baby, I was out there killing the dance floor. Oh my god! <laughs> and I remember my friend was like, "You gonna go to the club like that?" I was like, "Hell yeah!" I ain't the only one up here with a with a bandage upside her head. Everybody get beat. <laughs> my friend finger around that finger wave around that gunshot wound. Baby, and, and we couldn't put the dry on it because it was still kind of yeah. sore. And them waves was kind of still wet. And you know, them waves are dry in the air. Yeah. Baby, the, them waves had laid down by the time we left out of that club that night. Oh my God. What was the scenario behind that? Because I was, I don't know, I'm trying to, I've been studying on you a few days now. I don't know if I read it or if I seen it in an interview, but you were saying that you was determined to find the funny in that joke about being shot in the uh -huh. head. Like, yes. What was the situation, and why did you feel the need to find the funny in the joke? I mean, in in I being think, shot in the I head. I think I think the darker the situation is, the more, the more fucked up the situation is, uh -huh. the more I want to make it funny. Okay. So I would tell people I got shot in the back of the head, and they wouldn't laugh. And I was like, it's funny to me. <laughs> and my husband was like, it's not funny. I'm like, yes, it is. And it took me two years to find something to put there, and I said. I, you know, I said my kid's father he shot me in the back of the head, but it was not his fault. It was my fault because I ducked slow. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and there's the funny. You yeah. know, you got to be able to, hey, get down. You get I, hit. I guess that's the finding the, the testimony in, in the situation. Yeah. Like at the end of the day, you try to take me out, but it didn't happen. Well, kind of, is that like it, it, well I looked at it like this. Um, you know, because I was so young. I was 15 when I got shot. And um, my mama taught me as a kid, she said, the more, she said, if a man don't hit you, he don't love you. So mm -hmm. I thought every black guy, and every time he hit me with his roller skate, that was love, baby. Every time he hit me in the head with that stop on the end of that skate, that was love. So when he shot me, I was like, oh, my God, you really love me now. <laughs> you know, so... Um, I took it as love. Wow. A lot of women take abuse of it as love. You know, mine speak it. Yeah, so, you know, I didn't know any better. I mean, it, it literally took being in this relationship almost 10 years before I was fed up with the black guys and, you know, the beat downs and the dragons and, you know, the mentally and physically abused. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he, he used to tell me all the time, he was a, he was an ugly bitch. He used to tell me that all the time, and I went into a makeup shop one day, and they put me on makeup. And, it, and she was like, you are so pretty. And I yes, was like, no, are. I'm not. And she was like, yes, you are. And and I, the, the, my really good friend of mine, she passed away last year. Yeah, been a year now. But that I went in that shop almost every day so the lady could tell me she was pretty. Wow. Oh, my gosh. I went in that shop. Every, and I've never been around so many, you know, just strong, educated black women uh -huh. sitting in that shop. It's an opera art shop called Dendera in Atlanta. And I learned so much from educated black women. I dropped out of school in the eighth grade. I didn't have a, a role model. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't have anybody to look up to. Uh, I looked up to Jane Cleaver off this uh, Leave It to Beaver. <laughs> 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 I wanted to be that kind of mom. Wow. So when she started to, that late, uh, her name is, um, not so late, uh, Belinda. When Belinda first told me I was pretty, that started to build my self-esteem. Wow. And they had no idea that I was like getting beat down and talked to and treated the way I was getting treated. Mm -hmm. But I thought it was love. But in that eyebrow arching arch shop, I learned to love myself. Because it was nothing like seeing black judges, educated black women. I have to tell this story. So I'm sitting there one day, everybody got their nose in the air, and here I am, the drug dealer, you know, I'm educated. Well, I'm a street bitch. So I walk in there, and they say, oh my God, they freed Nelson Mandela. And I'm like, 
Who the hell is Nessa oh, Mandela? Wow. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so I was always taught by my teacher, Miss Troop, at English Avenue Elementary in Atlanta. The dumbest question is the question not asked. So I asked this lady who praised me, they free Nelson Mandela. So I said, who the hell is Nelson Mandela? Uh -huh. She said, oh, you don't know who Nelson Mandela uh -huh. is. I said, bitch, I don't know who my real daddy is. <laughs> but if you tell me, I'm going to go out and tell somebody else who Nelson Mandela is. Right, right. And she told me who he was. And I said, now I know who Nelson Mandela is. I'm going to teach this to my daughter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's how I learned. I learned so many things in that Alvarez shop. And one of the things I learned, who was Nelson Mandela? He was free. And you learned that she was beautiful. I learned that I was beautiful, yeah. <laughs> it started to build my self-esteem in that shop. And I, lo I love that story because uh, we're, we don't pay attention to the positive going on around us because that negative rings so much louder only because, like how you said, you were taught love is this way. I, I was told the same thing. A man may cheat on you, but if he come back, he wants you. Oh. Uh, he may do this, but that's just because, yeah, I was taught those things too. A lot of us were. And it takes, like you said, stepping outside of that box that you're used to and getting around others to see, okay, no, I, I, I can build this within me too. Because yeah. it's built within someone else as well. It's, it's who we choose to have, let be our examples. Yeah. It's who we choose to let be our example. That's 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 awesome. And I, you know, I just told myself, I said, you know, constantly black guys, constantly getting beat on, constantly S T D. This can't be love, mm -hmm. you know. And he, and he, he had me so brainwashed. He say, I might cheat, but you're number one. So when the girls would come around, I'm number one. Oh, I'm not the first lady. What am I, first lady of the ghetto? <laughs> That's exactly what I was. And then every time he cheat, it was always a baby. And they wanted to oh. flaunt the baby in my face. And, you know, and it was just, I just, I had to, I started, I just had to learn to love myself. I'm in my 40s now, and I can truly say I love myself. I don't tolerate no bull crap. Okay. I don't have time for bull crap. And, you know, it, it took a lot to get where I'm at today. You know, physically emotionally, everything. It, it took a lot to get there. It's, it's when, you, when you haven't been taught to love, self-love, that's a hard thing to, 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 to learn later on in life. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Because then you started to ask yourself, is it, you know, are you worthy yes. of a man treating you like somebody? Yes. Are you worthy of a, somebody to respect you? Is it okay? You know, it, and I, I was telling somebody this today, I said, as a, a lot of time when you've been in a bad relationship, you drag all that bad baggage into the next relationship. Mm -hmm. And I, I found myself doing it until he sat me down and he was like, you know, me and my first kid's father fought all the time. Mm -hmm. Black my eyes, stomped me down, shot me, everything. Well, here I am ready to beat the next man down. He's like, oh, hold on, hold on. You don't hit me and I don't hit you. Mm. And from that day on, I, I, I hit him in the head with a, uh, I hit him with a, uh, a yellow pages, one of them thick ass <laughs> yellow pages, and he, he, he hit me back that day, and he said, "Look, you don't hit me, and I don't hit you," and I'm like, "That's how that work? Yeah, that's all I gotta do. Not hit you, and you ain't gonna hit me." And he's like, "That's it. Been with him 26 years." He said, "You, I, you, you got, I'm gonna treat you right, and I expect you to treat me right." Wow. wow. And you know that was that was something new for me. Having a man not call me B word and H word and tell me I'm ugly and you know um, to pay attention to me and mm -hmm. act like he like, that was something new to me. That was something new to me. It was you know it was it was scary. Yeah, it was scary when you find somebody that, that truly give a damn about right. you. Right, you don't know how to accept that feeling. It's 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 hard at it's like you you have to learn every day. Okay, it's so you're not gonna hit me. I'm yeah. Not, okay, so you 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 are gonna still be around. <laughs> yeah. <because laughs> you're not mad at me for this, or you know you. I, I get it. I get it. Yeah, and, and you know like, and I only I had two kids, and my uh, the man I'm with, my husband, he was straight out of the military, no kids. And I was like, I found a black man with no kids, no mm -hmm. baby mamas to beat up. You know, since the 90s, I was beating up all the baby mamas. Right. So, <laughs> girl, I was, I was knocking out more baby mamas than Mike Tyson. Girl. 
Please, I was beating them down. <laughs> so, um, when I found him, didn't have no kids, and he had two kids, and I, I tell you, it was not my type. I mean, it was not. I was very into skinny guys like Dave Chappelle, and he was more like Ice Cube size, and I was like, this is not my type. And it was a conversation. He was intelligent, mm -hmm. and the time he took over my kids, I, I remember when I, I was a. I used to forge checks and I ran out the forge checks and come back and he was like, do you know how smart your daughter is? And then I said, oh yeah, she's, she can read, she's pretty smart. He said, but do you know your son don't know nothing? <laughs> I was like, what you talking about? I was like, I got that. He was like, son kind of done. Uh -huh. yeah, like, but then the next thing I know, he goes up to Kmart and buy all of these learning books and started to teach my son. Oh, wow. And I was like, Lord, thank you for this baby daddy, Jesus. Thank you, wow. thank you, thank you. And he gave him a solid foundation and he was such a great father figure to my my kids and what I like what I love the most about my husband you know how you get out of a bad relationship you got two kids and the mama put the daddy down and I started yeah. to do that he said hey don't do that he said do not instill that crap into those kids head whatever you think that that man is let them find out on their own and that day mm -hmm. from that day on I zip my lip I never talk bad about their father Mm. So whatever they think of their daddy now, it's a relationship they had with him or the relationship they didn't have with him. I never talked about him. He stopped me. He said, "Don't, don't do that." He said, "Cause you don't, you don't want them kids to find out that maybe he's not that person that you say he mm. is. Let them find out on their own." Ooh, and yes. I never talk. I never put their daddy down again. Wow. Never. <laughs> <laughs> it may get hard because I know I got the baby daddy situation. It gets hard, but like I think growing in my situation with my, with my mother, she would down my dad, and I didn't like to hear it. And eventually, I seen it on my own. But I had the correlation to not take what she was saying. I want I wanted to see it for myself. Yeah. Eventually, I saw it on my own. So for my own self, my son's situation, I try not to speak bad about his dad as best I can and just let him you know now now he's 17 by this time he's now coming around to see okay well it's not mom saying these things it's he said he was gonna do this and he didn't do it yeah and you know I, I eventually had to step back and be like okay well what did your dad tell you well he said he was gonna do this okay so then you need to to check him mom can't keep checking him yeah. for you because now you're at an age you can let him know your feelings about what he's doing because he ain't listening to me. Yeah. <laughs> it got to come from you. My son is 32 and, and the only thing, he didn't, he didn't my daughter kind of had a relationship with her father later on, but my, my son really never had a relationship because we ended up moving to Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. And he said the only thing I remember about this man is he promised to buy me some shoes. And I was like, what are you talking about? He said, he never bought me the shoes. And I was like, well, who bought you the shoes? He's like, Gary bought me these, uh, my husband bought him those uh, lug boots, but they, he said he got joned out so bad for them, school, them shoes because they had a zipper on the back. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, at least he bought you the shoes that your daddy never got you. Uh -huh. <laughs> you got some shoes, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> well, you have this, your, your new book has come out recently, Rabbit. The paper bag. Rap, yes, I got me a paper couple, couple I'm going to use in my facility where I work at it in the Los Padrino Juvenile Hall, but it, it's it's your memoir, it's your going from, like you said, the bootlegging, still in the boot, uh, at, at your, your granddaddy's bootlegging to becoming a drug a drug dealer, and a, a successful one, actually. I, I don't know if drug dealers are ever, ever successful, they all end up in jail, I don't know why people get that word successful from. Uh, let's just say I made a lot of money when uh -huh. I was young. <laughs> How was it? Okay, you have two kids this young, and at the same time you're you're selling drugs. I, I've seen an interview where you talked about admitting, which which I commend you for, because a lot of I think mothers or even dads can't admit, hey, I wasn't a good father, I wasn't a good I wasn't a good mother. But you had uh, spoke about being a bad mother not because of just your age but you felt like you still should have known better how, how how did you manage to i guess wake up and see that 
Well, going to jail made me uh, really realize um, it was the only time in my life that my life slowed down. Mm-hmm. So it made me realize uh, I was giving my kids what my mom gave me. And when uh, I got my life together, I just always wanted to apologize to my kids. And, you know, at the time, my kids didn't realize their mother was 15 with an eighth grade education and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And I just told my kids, I said, I was a horrible mom. A lot of moms would never admit that. Mm-hmm. I was horrible. But I had to do what I had to do so you guys wouldn't experience what I went through. Hunger and molestation and, you know, being, um, you know, being out on the street, being without a mom. You know, me sitting in jail uh, right, during that year really, really made me open my eyes. Mm-hmm. You know, and I was like, I, I can't do it. I cannot, I cannot let my kids go through what I went through. And I, I remember when my daughter went off to college, she was the first one to graduate in my family in three generations. So when she went out to college and she called me up and she was like, Mom, I was like, what? She's like, all my friends been molested. And she said, I feel so bad because I don't have a molestation story. And my heart dropped. And I was like, oh, my God, I did my job. Amen. I saved my baby. You know, because I can give you a hundred of them. Right. <laughs> but, you know, I protected her so. I think I protected her so much. That's why she gave <laughs> Lord, I protected my child into gay milk. <laughs> into gayness. <laughs> I said, I knew you've been gay. I let somebody tap this. <laughs> you, she ain't mad at me, and obviously. <laughs> she just. Oh, she's a proud gay. Like, give me a shout out, mama, so I can get them girls. <laughs> <laughs> she, a li- she a lipstick legend, you know, and you always want the shout out. Oh my God! You know, and she switch girls like we switch wigs. <laughs> I'm like, is that considered being a hoe in lesbian? Yeah, now? she's a hoe. She's a hoe. She's a gay hoe. <laughs> can I say? Oh, can I curse on here? My, my husband say she's a fuck girl. Oh no. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I said, if you the man, you have a lot of kids. Man, seriously. You know what she do? She do that really pisses me off. She go out with these girls and she adopt animals from the shelter and then they break up. So I was like, you're a deadbeat dad. You're leaving dogs all over the place. <laughs> yeah. Stop adopting these animals with these girls that you're not going to stick you're with. You're not going to stick with them. Yeah. yeah. And then they argue about who, who we can to keep the dog. Oh no, that's too much. Yeah, she got like five dogs. I'm trying to get rid of my dogs. <laughs> I was like, how do you get rid of dogs? And one I've had for 13 years, the other one I've had for three. When you're tired of them, what you do? What do they die? I was at the um, service station and he was t- uh, talking to, uh, I walked them with me because it's right down the street, so we walk, we walk back home as I drop off the car. But I was talking to uh, one of the men up there, a kid, and he was like, well, you could do it like how my mom would do it. like." None of our dogs ever died of natural causes. <laughs> I was like, so what you mean? She took them to the, to the, get put down. He said, yes. I'm like, oh, I can't imagine doing that. <laughs> Dude, we didn't do that. We just, hey, you got to go. <laughs> drop they them so off at a park yeah. away no, from somewhere. No, you drop, but some of them know how to get home. Uh-huh. You're like, did I drop you off? Uh, eight states over, <laughs> eight counties over, they and they'd be back out. at you. Seriously. I, I haven't had a dog since. Um, I have a story where I tell, uh, I said, uh, Ronald Reagan killed my dog. Okay, he got real elected, girl, and we were so poor. And I had a dog named Pup Pup, and I'll never forget, I heard on the radio, we were listening to the radio, the new president, Ronald Reagan, that thing I heard, er, 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 my dog jumped up the porch and killed himself. Really? Yeah, them Republicans killed my damn dog. <laughs> I never vote Republican. The Pup Pup was like, I'm out of here. If y'all didn't feed me in the last four years, I'm sick of neck bone. He just jumped up the porch. <laughs> and killed I, I haven't had a dog since Pup Pup killed himself. I, I, I can't, I boo-hoo, I can't believe Papa left me like that. <laughs> All because Ronald Reagan got real late. <laughs> Jumped off that back porch, he said, I'm out this bitch. So, you live this hectic lifestyle that I wouldn't wish on anybody, but to you it felt like norm. What, 
for you, what was the transition like going from Miss, I'm sorry, Rabbit to now Miss Pat? Um, <laughs> I always tell people it was the help of regular people that care. Okay. And, you know, looked out and, and didn't judge and helped me turn my life around. Nobody gets anywhere in this world by themselves. Mm -hmm. Don't believe that. Somebody's always handed something. And, you know, with my caseworker, my teacher, my husband, just people looking out for me. Mm -hmm. When I moved from, when I moved, when I stopped being in the hood and moved into a suburban neighborhood in River Judge, Georgia, to get my life together, it was, it was, it was, it was crazy because I had to go get a job. Okay. I had to go get a job at McDonald's and I was like, at that time, they was making four dollars and twenty five cents an hour. Yeah. I was like, who worked for this when you can sell crack and and forge white people checks? <laughs> <laughs> and like you said, you were making good money. I was making good money, but I was willing to give up the streets to save my kids and to save myself. Because my husband, I was still kind of selling drugs when I met him. And he said, hey, what happened if you get killed? Do you want their daddy to have them? What happened if you go to jail? Do you want their daddy to have them? I was like, oh, no, no, no. Uh -uh, you got all them kids. And he said, well, you better do something because you headed down the wrong street, wrong road. Yeah. And so I said, I'm willing to give it all up. Plus, I was I was willing to give it all up because I was, I had somebody there to help me. Mm. He was willing to, you know, take on the kids and help me turn my life around. And I love telling this story how, how sweet my husband is. I went to go meet his mama who was super Christian, who sat straight up at Golden Corral like she was at a million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nose up in Golden Corral. Huh? Yeah. I always held her finger so you can see a diamond ring, rest in peace. My mother in law. So we sitting there, we eating, and um, and me, you know, nobody really showed me how to eat. I'm from mm -hmm. I'm just eating like a dog. Me and my kid bit over, got the got it in our hand, the whole hand around the floor. Yeah. And I'm laying in bed that night, and my husband's like, hey, he's, I was like, what? He's like. I say, he said, I want to say something, but I don't want to offend you. I said, say it. He said, anybody ever showed you how to eat with a fork? And I was like, what's wrong with the way I eat with a fork? Yeah, yeah. He was like, it's not correct. And I'm like, what, what you talking about? I said, well, show me how to eat with a fork. And we got out of bed and went to the kitchen. Oh, my and he gosh. showed me how to hold a fork correctly. And I was like, Lord, I'm in love. Oh, my god. I don't god. no tattoo, but this Negro don't talk me how to eat with a fork. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know you got a good man when they show you how to eat with a fork. Was there ever, ever any ever a time when you thought like, man, fuck this McDonald's shit. I'm going to go back doing what I know how to do. Nah, I had love. In my whole life, that's all I ever wanted. Wow. So when I got real love, nah, I was willing to work at McDonald's. Wow. Because to me, love conquered everything. Mm -hmm. And I finally had that in my life. I finally had somebody who gave a fuck about me. So I wasn't going to mess it up. You know how a lot of times you get out of a relationship and then you go back and you mess with your ex? Uh-huh. Child, please. I didn't look back twice. <laughs> I didn't look back twice because I knew what I had at the house was gone. Wow. I knew what I had at the house. If I lost it, I'm, I might never get it again. Mm. So I wasn't That's willing beautiful. to risk that for anything. That's beautiful. You don't risk love. And I tell people all the time, the key to a relationship is honesty. Okay. When you break, when you break that honesty code, it's over. Because that you, I mean, you, you, you open up a whole nother world. And I've never had a problem with this man. And he's never had a problem with me other than I be cursing all the time. <laughs> but, <laughs> I, you know, I don't doubt. There's not a day goes by that I, I doubt this guy care about me and my uh -huh. kids. Oh, wow. If, you know, if my husband loves us, I know I'm loved now. I'm happy. I gave up the street for love, and, and I'm happy. You know, I don't, have to, I don't have to make another dime doing comedy. I got a family. Mm. And that means everything to me. I'm making my family go on a Disney cruise right now. He's like, we don't want to go to Canada. I said, shut your ass up. We family. We going. We going. We going. He's like, oh. I told my husband, you going. You, if you don't go, you know, that's one of the things I tell him. I said, I don't ask you guys for nothing. Mm. All I ask you to do is do family stuff with me. That's what make me happy. I, you know, I see that you, you, 
you gang like custody of your, your sister's kids? My, I had custody of my sister kids for 10 years. Me and my husband raised them. Now I have custody of my niece kids. And she just tricked the bitch. She, I brought her to my house to help her turn her life around. Girl, she dropped them off and, and blocked me on Facebook. <laughs> no, she did. <laughs> no, she did. So now I'm raising a four, a six, a nine, and an eight year old. God bless your heart. It's, it's, it's like you've gone through so much to now, like you said, you found love, you pulled yourself out of all this, and it, and it seems like, is there any like feelings that you have towards the fact that I, sometimes we feel like when we're the ones trying to make the way in our family, we think everybody's going to follow suit, follow along, and, and kind of make, kind of fix themselves up too. Like, you hope? What, what do you, I don't know, how do you feel about your current state of family members? If, if, uh, is a lot of it still going on? What yeah, was going on? It's still going on. My, my sister having a abuse problem. You know, I have a few relatives that, that won't change. You know, my brother went to prison. He made a, a big change in his life. He, you know, he's, he have a family. But, you know, I, I learned this. You can't save everybody. Mm -hmm. Save the ones that want to be saved. And it's hard to save grown people. So... And my, to break the cycle of my family, I try to save the kids. Okay. So people are like, How, why would you take on those four kids? I said, because every child deserves a solid foundation. Every child. If you give them a solid foundation, I truly believe that they will grow. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you give them rocks, they're going to stumble their whole life. Okay. That's what I believe. And that's why I took those four kids. Because I didn't want... This, when I picked my niece up and she had a, a two-week-old baby wrapped in a blanket that was homeless, that touched me. Because when I look at those kids, those kids, to me, I see Rabbit, the little mm. girl that had nobody to come along and save her. Okay. I didn't yeah, want them yeah. to go through what I went through. Okay. Like, I want them to have a chance. To have a chance. And I tell you, I call my crack baby, my husband, man. Stop calling me baby crack baby. <laughs> Baby, they're the most bougiest crack baby you ever want to see now. You all see my eyes say, y'all want some McDonald's? McDonald's. You don't, eat, you don't eat McDonald's. We eat Chick-fil-A. And I say to myself, I remember when y'all didn't eat at all. Uh, <laughs> I got some. Bougie. And my niece be like, uh, which uh, books, boots you want me to put on today? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. One of them like so prissy and the other one like really tomboyish. Then, it's a, then my niece, the youngest is four. And she just, oh, she's a million questions. You know what? I, and I love them. I love them so much. They, they brought me back. Brought me back. I don't know what I would be doing that my youngest have graduated. And I didn't have these kids in my life. And, you know, when, when God first dropped them, I was like, oh, God. You got to stop dropping these crack babies yeah. off. Yeah. This is it. I'm too old. I'm, I'm done with your crack baby keeping stuff, Lord. But maybe this is my last set, you know. You know, and, and I just see the joy on their face. You know, to see the ones that, like, my, the four-year-old that didn't go through that, mm -hmm. to see the oldest one, like, these kids was hiding food, and they was still in the refrigerator, mm -hmm. and they just can't get full. And, and, and the more I see them, the more I saw rabbit. My husband called me one day, he's like, guess what Yolanda said? She told my niece one day, she said, Mama, at this house, we eat every day. So can you imagine what this kid had gone through before I picked them up homeless one Christmas? Wow. With nothing, and I brought them home, and I say, I don't know how I'm gonna take care of five people, Lord. You gotta work this out. Uh -huh. Me and my career started to yeah. do nice things, and then she just took off. And I'm like, well, what am I supposed to do with I, four I was kids? Gonna ask, how do you ha how do you juggle? You, you know what? Juggle the, your career and and now this more extended family. We love each other. So I have a, my daughter is 20. She got accepted into Marion University. She had a lot of nice scholarships in school that accepted her. Okay. But since my career is doing so well, she said, Mama, I'm not leaving my daddy with these kids. Okay. She said, because my daddy go to work every day, and he ain't going to be helping you with all of these kids. So she chose to go to a two-year college. Uh, hopefully my career can take a bigger step so later on she can go back and get her master. Oh, wow. That's what family is all about. That's love. And every time I look at her, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on the road, she get them off of school, she feed them my 18-year-old son help, my 30-year-old son and his girlfriend help. And that's a family. Wow. And you know, all to help me get what, follow my dream, but also help these kids at the house 
to be in a stable situation. So they can drink. So they can drink. I'm here because of the drink. One of the biggest things my teacher ever told me, she said, Patricia, you can do and be anything in this world you want to be. All you got to do is drink. I'm 46 years old and I've been dreaming my whole life. What did it take for you to believe that in that, that saying? Because I know it, it sounds cliche. We yes. tell it to everybody, but what made it click for I you? Think, you know what? Because this lady would take me into the bathroom at school because I was a dirty kid, musty hair, comb my hair, brush my teeth, wash me up, feed me behind everybody's back so I wouldn't get picked on. Wow. So uh, I think when people tell you something and you know they really care, it sinks in. When I was doing time in jail, I would always quote this truth. And anybody knows me personally, no, I quote this truth. Get out of my face, Miss Troop said, I can do it, be anything I want to be. Yeah. When I told my husband I was a comedian, he was like, oh no, I said, Miss Troop said, fuck what you say, Miss Troop said. And Miss Troop is dead now. But I live, I'm still living off the words that she put in me so many years ago. Nobody had ever told me that. Nobody, nobody had ever told me I could dream. Nobody had ever told me that I could do it and be anything I wanted to be. Only thing I was ever told was you was a bitch in a hole and shit the fuck up. Mm. And you ugly. That's all I ever was told. But this lady come along and teaches me how to read and, and, and help me. So why wouldn't I believe that? Mm. That's, that was the first thing I could grab on to believe in. Mm. I knew if I got to school early, Miss Troop had food for me. I knew if I got to school early, Miss Troop had clean clothes for me. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't I believe? That's why I tuck in those four kids. Yeah. Because I never want them to <laughs> go through what I went through. One of the most embarrassing things ever, like, you know, when you go in, in, in inner city school, they would always give the poorest kid in the class the uh, Thanksgiving box. Okay. I, oh, I fucking hate it. Because we was always considered a poor kid. Uh -huh. All me and my brothers and sisters got their Thanksgiving box. I'm tired of fucking for having that box. Bring that box. Home. Bring that box home. We eat. <laughs> and wow. then you get picked out. Picked up. Y'all got the Thanksgiving box, and all the kids don't brought the, the cans good. Uh -huh. So it was an embarrassment. So I remember when I when when they was offering it to these kids, and I said, "Don't you ever in your fucking life offer me a Thanksgiving box." <laughs> I, I, I I'm not that poor. Uh -huh. Give it to somebody else. I'm not putting it down. But as certain things in my life. That I don't ever want to see again. Mm. And it's chicken ass and it's Thanksgiving boxes. <laughs> Ate a lot of chicken ass. I thought it was nugget. <laughs> chicken <laughs> ass. <laughs> My mother called them Negro nuggets. What? <laughs> yeah. It was good until you grow up and realize you're eating all that ass. <laughs> Maybe that's what my daughter gave. It skipped oh me and hit her. <laughs> How did you think to be, start com comedy? Uh, a trip to like, was you comedy. always telling stories, or did you? I was when did you find stories. the funny in what, I don't what you know. was going I, through? I, I, honestly, I always been like this. I, okay, I, like I would go to my kids' football games, and all the parents just gather around. Oh, Pat's so funny, but I never thought I was fucking funny. Uh -huh. I was just being me. This has been me for forty six years. And um, a caseworker told me, you know, I'm down there trying to run a scheme. <laughs> And she was like, you, you fucking funny. And I was like, oh, no, I just want to tell, you know, I just want some food stamps to go home and watch the young university. She's like, you have a talent. And so I went to school to be a medical assistant, really couldn't get a job because I'm a convicted felon and it's drugs. So um, I went on to work at General Motors for a little while and she was like, no, you should really look into this comedy mm. thing. And I went to open mic and I found myself and, you know, about Seven years in, I started to get really personal, and it started to become healing. Okay. It's such a heal. It, it healed me so much. I was so angry. I hated my mother. I hated my first kid's father. I hated people who let me down. And it, it, I learned to forgive through comedy. Through comedy. Because I, I learned a lot about myself and my family. And my mama gave me what she was given. She, you know, you don't know better, you don't do better. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I just started to tell these stories, and the more I told these stories, the more I started to heal. Wow. When it came to the molestation, which was from your mother's boyfriends, 
boyfriends or boyfriend? But that's the what I told you, boyfriend. Okay. Uh, and you didn't start telling these stories till after she was gone. I just, that's the first time I ever told this story when I woke up. Oh. I never told anybody. Why didn't... I, I, how did you find that healing? To be able to tell that tell? Well, you know, knowing that I've been through what I've been through, you know it had to happen the way I grew up. Um, when I was talking to the lady in the book, we, we talked about it, and I had never cried about it. And when I told it to her, and I said, well, let me just hold on for a second. I said, let me call my sister just to make sure I'm not making this stuff up. You know, because you block it out and it become mm. unreal to you. Okay, and yeah. so I tell my, I call my sister and all I said, I said, you know what Mr. John did to us? And she said, yes. And I said, okay. So I hung up the phone and I told Janine and I said, I'm ready to tell you. Okay. And um, I never told the story. And my husband was shocked. Never talked about it. Never wanted to talk about it. Because, you know, coming up like that, the man provided for my mom. And um, he paid, he up there with a rent, he bought us food. And if we told, we would have lost all that. We moved all the time. We got evicted all the time. We went hungry all the time. So I, I think I felt like I was helping out by not telling. Mm. Because if I told, we wouldn't eat. We wouldn't have a place to stay. Because she would run Mr. John. Mr. John had the money. Pressure. So, you know, you just look the other way and act like it never happened. So I ignored it for 44 years. Until I, 45 years until I broke the book. And that's when I told the story. Do you feel like you need an apology from this person? Or are you flushed of it at this He's point? He's dead. I can't oh. get an apology. So I forgave him. Because when you hate something or somebody, that hate will control you. And I'd be damned if I let anybody control me. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to, like I said, I used to hate my mama, I used to hate my first kid's father. He was one of the first the people I hated. I just forgave everybody. Because it was a knot in my chest that would not let me be happy in my current life with all of that hatred built up. And I said, I gotta let it go so I can be happy. So I forgave him. And people ask me, how can you forgive somebody? It's easier to forgive than hate. Hate take energy. When you hate somebody, you gotta wake up every day and hate that person. <laughs> when you forgave them, you don't let the shit go. I don't think about Mr. John. Uh -huh. I don't think about my first kid's father. I don't think about my mama. I don't even think about the other people that hurt me in my life. Because I for fucking forgave them and I let it go. My, I remember my husband said, how can you forgive somebody who never asked? They don't have to ask. I did it for me. For you. Because if That's I was weird. waiting on them to say something, I'd still be fucking waiting. So why am I waiting on you to make me happy? I'm going to make my damn self happy. My kid's father ain't never said he's sorry for shooting and beating me, taking my child. He was 22 years old, married with a wife. Here I am, 12 years old, 13 years old, in elementary school carrying his baby. Mm. Beating me fucking down to the ground, mentally, physically, and emotionally. He ain't never apologized, and he don't have to, because I've already, I've already forgiven him, and I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I mean, I have a life, I have a career. I'm a fucking work at Jiffy Lube. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good, man. I'm good. I'm good. Well, I, I'm, I'm okay. That sounds like so much advice. And you, you found love. You found a lot of things that helped guide along that way. What advice would you give for someone who's in that maybe the beginning stages of it and recognizing? Because comedy is, has helped helped you with the healing. What advice would you give someone else? Learn how to love yourself. Love yourself. Mm -hmm. Love. You don't need nobody to tell you nothing about yourself that you don't already know. I mean, love yourself. That's what got me here. I started to care about me. Mm -hmm. You know, for especially women, we put so much time into other people. Our kids, our parents, our family. We forget about us. Forget about us, yeah. And then I, I told myself one day, I said, how can I love my kids being in this situation when I don't even love myself? Me and my daughter gonna grow up thinking it's okay for somebody to crack you across the head with a uh -huh. pistol. Mm -hmm. Beat you down, drag you out the house. My daughter saw all that shit. 
You know, I remember her yeah. calling the police. Police, he's stomping her right now. He beating her with a skate. <laughs> you know, you got your yeah. six-year-old calling the police for you. You okay, mama? You okay? Yeah. No I, I, child I, should I, ever have to see that. So, I just, I, I had to give it all up. I had to learn to love her. Act. Learn to love yourself. Learn I don't talk yourself. no bullshit. I love me. <laughs> and I'm, I'm happy. I, I got to say, you know, I'm here today because I'm loved. A man came along. I, my kids, family, people came along and cared about me. And my whole life, all I ever searched for was love. And I tell people all the time, it's not about how you start. It's about how you finish. And I think I'm finishing pretty damn good. Yeah, you ain't finished yet. No, you I'm still finished. in the you you in the come on. That finish ain't till we lay the rest. All the rest <laughs> of it will show is, is that work and I'm testimony in between. I'm winning the race. So born and raised in Atlanta. Yeah. <laughs> Home of the hot wing and sweet tea. It's rock side. <laughs> comedy started in Atlanta. Yes, uptown comedy. And I've been, I'm, I can say I've been. Um, I feel like when it comes to Atlanta, like even though I'm out here in LA and you, you're out here and, and traveling and stuff, I feel like Atlanta comedy is so tight knit. Like it's a tight knit fan. That's how I view Atlanta comedy. I haven't been there so long. When I was there, it was. Okay. It was. And Atlanta got a lot of funny comedians too. But, um, I don't know what the comedy scene is now because I've been in Indianapolis for mm. 10 years. Was, what, was there a different trans, transition yeah. oh my going God. from having that close-knit in, in, in Atlanta than going up to Indianapolis? Because I went straight from urban scene to a mainstream scene, Okay, white. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was all white comedy clubs. They had different rules that okay. you could follow by. No matter what you've done, you had to start from the bottom. Okay. And I was like, oh, I'm better than all of you guys, and I got to take this shit. Yeah. So it, moving to Indianapolis humbled me a lot. It did. It okay. taught me a lot. It taught me patience. I learned a lot about comedy the right way. Mm. I learned a lot about comedy. I learned how to write jokes. I know, uh, you know, uh, what is it? Premise, punchline, setup. I learned all of that stuff there. And Atlanta's fast paced. Fast pace, just get to the punchline, get to the punchline. Uh -huh. And moving to Indianapolis, that's how I truly believe I became a storyteller. Okay. Like, I'm at the point now, I'm, I'm comfortable, so I don't give a fuck. I'm going to do my shit the same way. I don't care who in the audience. Okay. And I have such a mainstream following that I still do me in front of all of these white people. Okay. I would never change who I am, because this is me. When you come to see me, you come into my world. I'm going to take you on a field trip. I know you, you said it in an interview some, somewhere that your audience is more mainstream than it is black. Are they, you get more invited to the mainstream situations as opposed yeah. to the black situation. Why do you think that is? Podcasts, um, mainstream, uh, radio, a lot of podcasts. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, and you know, um, I, black people, <laughs> black people, you discover you when you're already famous. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I got a few people that have been rocking with me from the start. You uh -huh. know who I am. And then I have a lot of uh, white fans that have been with me from the very first podcast. Mm, okay. And before black people even really got into the podcast. Yeah, you so, know a lot of them. Yeah, and uh, you know, I've done a lot of the big mainstream. Mm -hmm. So, you know, black people don't, they'll jump on, the, they'll jump on when, they, when you're famous. Like, where you been? What the fuck you mean where I been? I've been doing this shit 17 years, 16 mm. years. So I don't, I'm not in that, I'm not in that main, that, that urban circle either. Okay. You know, it's not a lot of black clubs. In, you know? in Indianapolis? Nowhere. There ain't no black club owners. Uh, mm. One or two. Okay, but, I understand that. you know, urban clubs, so I play a lot of the improvs and stuff like uh -huh. that. Those are different rules. You're not going to go in there and, and do a 30 minutes in between each, uh, Comedian, <laughs> they don't play that shit. You got rules, and I mean, I done got older now. I like those rules. Uh -huh. I'm not playing a club where everybody can do a guest spot. That's not what I came to do. I came to do my an hour. I came to take my ass home, uh -huh. take this bank off, pull this wig off, and go to bed. I don't got time to play with you, motherfucker. <laughs> do your guest spot somewhere else. Oh my god, <laughs> I'm grown, child. So you haven't been in Atlanta in a while. 
I go to Atlanta all the time. I mean, buy my wigs, get my hair fit, uh-huh. hang out. But I'm doing comedy. I'm there in October, uh, first week of October, I think. Okay. They At have the punchline. Oh, the punchline for week of October. Later on, my birthday's in October. But um, they're doing like a lot of industrial work down there. Do you think like like communities like where you came from on the what like West End? Do you, do you think they would do well with gentrification? <laughs> do you think Child, it could happen? I'm a homeowner, so I got a different view on gentrification. Uh, okay. I bring on the white people and the gays who plant flowers. <laughs> <laughs> My husband's going to get mad at these guys. Don't that shit hey, I'm a homeowner. Some people bring down your property back. Uh-huh. So, <laughs> I... <laughs> Uh, I don't think no area get you, it's, gentrification is not good for any area where you raise taxes and push out people that can't afford the taxes, mm, true. which is wrong. Yeah, but you know, there's nothing wrong with a little change. You know, as a, as black people, we gotta learn to keep up our own community so others won't come in. Mm. You don't see black people or, or when, well, you do see us running their community and running them out their communities too. When I first moved to Riverdale, it was uh-huh. mostly white. Uh-huh. And two years for sale signs for everyone, I was like, where is the white people going? What's going really? on? And come to find out, they went to the uh, board meeting and found out that the bus system was coming in. And they all sold their house. And they left my ass there. My house went from $150-something thousand to $22,000. I was like, you white people, you would never fucking leave me again. <laughs> when you sell, I sell. <laughs> They left my ass. Really? They left my ass. Because so the I bus pay, system was the coming. Buses, they don't want that shit out there. That's a different type of traffic on the bus. Yeah. Yeah, so they'll, they'll never trick me again. <laughs> I learned that. They left my ass in Riverdale, Georgia. So you see nothing wrong with a little bit of change. A little bit of change, yeah. But, you know, I don't, I don't see nothing wrong with a little bit of change. Don't rat I don't. <laughs> Don't get me with that, because I don't need people right calling me a coon like my daughter be calling me a coon. Seriously, huh? <laughs> All I'm going to say is I'm a homeowner. <laughs> we going to take cover we out. We need more people who going to uh, plant flowers in the community. <laughs> <laughs> who going to put up bird seeds cages. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Shit make a difference for make your property value. Yeah, yeah, make dog parks. <laughs> yeah, dog parks. <laughs> you know. Uh, they treat dogs better yeah, than you. So, yeah, yeah. Who pick up dog shit. <laughs> <laughs> My neighbor's so bad when they don't. <laughs> <laughs> My neighbor always walking around with dog shit bags in the hand. I'm like, you can just have a baby and walk around with your shitty baby pamper in your hand. Yeah, yeah. I don't get it. If I gotta pick up your hot shit, I don't want you in my life. <laughs> That's why you ain't got no dogs since my no, that way. My husband come this age, but he got to go somewhere where they pick up hot shit. I don't pick up hot shit. Mm-mm, mm-mm. Oh my I'm going to have somebody there with me to help them pick up the hot shit. I can't do that. Oh and they God. just, they bathe them and they kiss them. And I have a friend here in I'll LA. I don't kiss me. I definitely well, I have, do that. I have a yeah. friend here who dog don't do nothing but bark and a dog, he loves the fucking dog. And I'm just like, shut the fuck up, dog. He's like, Talk to my dog like that. The motherfucker don't speak English. Yeah, shut up. <laughs> I be I be want to put his dog in the headlock all the time and just punch the shit out of it. All you do is bark. Oh my god. If I had dogs, I would slap shit out of him. Shut the fuck up, dog. I'm going to. I had a I had a dog one time. I bought from a crackhead, a little pet bull because the dog he was walking the he dog. He was full dog. mix. He was four. He's mixed. I don't know what the fuck he was. He was so hungry. I took him to McDonald's and he ate the shit out of that shit. And so we call him we call him Uzi. He looked like he was tough. He was punk. <laughs> <laughs> I should say the people. I'm sorry. He, he raced that part. He was, he was weak. He was punk. <laughs> My house got caught on fire. This motherfucker ran off and left the kid. I was like, I knew you one shit. Yeah. Yeah. My dog was weak as hell. My little arm uh, was a little. It was a pet bull that we called him Uzi. Growing up in the streets and especially running uh, your, your small business. <laughs> What would what would you look at to see if somebody was hard or not? Like, why didn't would, did many try to mess with you, or Nobody's could you to. see somebody coming and knew they wasn't hard? Well, people thought I was hard. I talk shit. People didn't know I was sixteen. Mm. Nobody knew I was sixteen. So people, I mean, I talk. I will fight you back in the day. Uh huh. So I didn't have problems. Only problem I ever really had was an old dude uh, shot me. 
I might have got robbed one or two times, but nothing serious. Yeah. And I was nice to people. Mm-hmm. You know, and people knew I had kids. So I didn't have that, you know, where they just spray up the whole neighborhood situation. Yeah. You know, it was kind of like a peaceful drug dealer. I didn't disrespect the crackhead and knock them all upside the head. Talk. They was customers. You wanted them to come back. So I didn't have that in yeah. the streets. My, my only problem I had was that I was in a bad relationship. Okay. No, 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 no. Somebody trying to test you or not. That's funny. No. I find it funny. Other than my baby daddy, baby mamas. That was it. Those was the only people I beat up all the time. Okay. Or fought all the time. I find it funny with like this social media era, how people come at their so-called enemies via FaceTime, via Instagram uh, stories and things like that. And then as soon as someone actually walks up on them, it's, hey, man, and they stand in their... their Behind the, the homies people as opposed don't, people to... People don't fight anymore. They uh-huh. kill you. So, I'm not about to argue with nobody. Yeah. Hey, you want that parking spot? Get it, baby. I'm going to buy a park down the street. I, I'm old. I don't have time for that. I don't even have the breath to argue with you anymore. Uh, you know. Yeah, yeah So, yeah. I'm grown. And what they do on social media, I don't know because I, I hate social media. <laughs> people always like, you should make videos. I said, I don't have time to put on makeup and comb my hair to entertain you. If you want me to entertain you, you buy a ticket and come see me. Yeah. I, I truly be I'm old school comedy. Uh-huh. I'm not gonna put you in my life like that every day. Okay. Yeah. Because it's, 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 it's unless like, it's something just truly unique. Yeah. I don't like doing what everybody else do. That's why I never got on drugs. That's why I don't okay. have gold teeth. That's why I have tattoos. <laughs> okay. I like being me. I don't like all that old following stuff. Yeah, yeah. You you were on last comic standing. Yeah. And um, Comedy High, we recently seen that uh, with this Roseanne situation, because you used to work with Roseanne, not only last time with Emmy, but you opened up for a few times. In Vegas, yeah. Was you expecting, she she blocked you on Twitter. <laughs> she did block me on Twitter. Did that come out of nowhere? That came out of nowhere. Because I know Wanda Sykes was your mentor on, yeah. on the show. You already have your relationship, in a sense, with uh, Roseanne. What, what was your thoughts on the situation that happened? Because I, I feel like I've heard you speak highly of both women. Um, well, I, 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 you know, it's not like me and Roseanne hung out all the time. We uh-huh. talked, you know, over the years, uh, ever since way back when I first met her on uh, World Funniest Mom. I, I didn't know that role. I didn't know that, that person. Mm-hmm. You know, I've never seen that. I never would have thought Roseanne be considered as a racist. Uh-huh. You know, I knew she was a Trump fan. I knew that, but just because you're a Trump fan don't mean you're racist. Okay, yeah, okay. But yeah. Th- when, when I woke up to them tweets, I was like, what the fuck is wrong with Rose? Yeah, yeah. You know, but I, that's not, you know, I didn't know a, ro- a racist Rose. Okay. I mean, she was always nice to me. The blocking me came out of nowhere, which shocked me. So, you know, I don't, you know, a lot of times, I truly believe older people stay up in the middle of the night because they're scared they're going to die in their sleep. So, they make a lot of mistakes because they didn't get the proper sleep. <laughs> you know, older people, they don't never go to sleep. Your granddad just said in front, I'm watching the TV. No, you sleep. Yeah, I see yeah, you sleep. Yeah. I, but I'm listening. Yeah. Well, how is you sleeping? You listening. Yeah. So, I think that's why Trump tweet in the middle of the in night. In the middle of the night. Roseanne tweet the wrong things in the middle of the night because they're not properly rested. Mm-hmm. You but, should be sleeping. You've probably been up all day. Well, they no, have... well, people don't be up all day either. <laughs> <laughs> so, just, I just think they don't sleep because they, they think they're going to die in the middle of the night. That's so funny. <laughs> but, you to look at I it. mean, I, I've always known a nice Rosé. Okay. That's not, I don't, I didn't know a racist Rosé. Did you respond or anything? Is, uh, we, to you, her blocking me? You, no, I'm saying. To her? No. Like, why would the block you? It just came out of nowhere. It just came out. I couldn't. She blocked me. I just went to go see what she was saying one day, and no, somebody tagged us together, uh-huh. and I clicked on hers, and I was like, "You blocked me? The fuck you blocked me for? Yeah, I see your tweets all the time about Trump. I don't get mad, but you know that's her page. She got that's her prerogative. She yeah, got, you know, I move on. Do you agree with um, what NBC did with the cancellation of the ABC. show? Oh, I'm sorry, ABC. Um, yes. Okay. You can't you can't say things like that about people. I mean you I mean you you can't talk like that about people. She'd have been she we would have accepted more. She'd be like, fuck you, Valerie Garrett. 
or something like that. But when you start happen. comparing black people to apes, you know, it ain't funny when you're a black person. No. You know, and then, I don't I've heard get that. I even heard people say that Valerie, you know, she she do look like the, the wife on the planet of the eight. I thought the lady was really pretty. Yeah. So I'm like, you it's not a joke when you when you say ugly stuff that was always always said about yeah. African American people. It, it's I, racist. I feel like there's just certain things you should know by now that outside of our race, whether it's black or you talk calling Asians whatever you call them, uh, you know, nips or whatever the case may be. You, there's certain things you should know you shouldn't say anymore. Not on Twitter. Period. I mean, it, it, I'm that's what you say. I'm going to say what the fuck I won't say in my house. <laughs> and that's what I was going to say. Behind I closed doors, that. around your peoples, who ain't going to uh, record you and then be like, um, look what Miss Pat just said. You get what I'm saying? But but I just feel like there's just certain things you should know now. You should well, say. You a hit you show make. on ABC. Why are you on Twitter? With a black child on it. With a black child on there, and then you gonna do a reference of a an nape, and, and we still, as black people, was trying to figure out why the fuck the black child was on there. <laughs> Who the hell gave you this black baby? <laughs> I figured somebody <laughs> who ain't on the show ain't no more had a baby because I haven't watched an episode but you know, yet. <laughs> each one teach one. You you learn the hard way. Yeah, you learn the hard way. I mean, I wish her well. I wish her love. I hate to see anybody lose something. Yeah. That big. But, you know, you make your bed, you got to lay in it. Every time I stole at the store and got caught, I had to pay for it. Mm -hmm. You got to pay for the bullshit you put yourself in. Being a female comedian, the world is, uh, yeah, women, we winning. We were doing well. Black women were definitely winning right now. Um, I feel like, and I hang out at a lot of comedy comedy hangouts with improv, laugh factory, whatever the case. It's always like one woman per guy, ten guys on a show. Do you do you feel as a woman like what do you feel as a woman you have to do to be competitive with with male with the male counterparts? Because sometimes I feel like maybe having to be a little extra crude or a little over sexual, sometimes harsh. Seems like sometimes what that's do you the mean way. Sexual when you dress? No, not sexual. Oh, I'm, I with, so. I'm talking about with the delivery of, of the actual well, comedy. Do you feel that has unique. to be done to I keep think, up? I think just being unique and being yourself. Mm-hmm. Like I know that I'm funny and I know that I'm unique. Nobody's talking about what I'm talking about. Okay. And you know nobody's telling the type of stories that I'm telling. Uh-huh. So I think that makes me stand out alone. Makes you unique. Okay. You know. I don't worry about being on a bunch of means. I'm funny. I didn't get here sucking dick. I didn't get here turning tricks. Uh huh. I got here because I'm funny. Okay. You know, you work on your craft, and you work on anything long enough, you can only become good at it. Hope. So I mean, it's a male-dominated world. Yes, but I mean, I'm in my forties, and I, I think I get looked over a lot. I look at, you can look at some of the white girls and, and you like, dang, why am I not where she at? Mm-hmm. We don't know what they saw in her that they don't see in me. Mm-hmm. So I don't complain. I just keep doing Miss Pat. Because eventually, the, you know, it's going to rise to the top. Okay. Cream rise to the top. That's all you got to do is just keep working on you. I keep working on me. Working and on I don't me. worry about what everybody else is doing. Okay. You know, I hear women all the time complaining about when you're African American, why you're not getting this versus you. What, what a white female comedian uh-huh. get who they might not think as good as they are. I said, worry about yourself. That's what I worry about. Okay. I'm do I do me. Eventually everybody else would notice me. <laughs> you know And I mean this is comedy. Yeah. You know, they can take these T V shows from you. They can take these movies from you. What they can never take from you is that stage. I'm gonna always be a comedian. Mm. You can always shoot a million movies. Eddie Murphy can go back to stand up right to this day and still sell the fuck out. Because he's still a comedian. Yeah. And we ain't seen Eddie Murphy in a movie in a while. Yeah. Hell, Martin came back. So, so I just continue to work on me. What comedians have inspired you along your journey? Richard Pryor, Bill Cosby, and Storyteller. I'm a big Chris Rock fan. Okay. Yeah, I'm a big Chris Rock fan. Any females leads that, that, that can't? I like Wanda Sykes. Wanda Sykes is very funny. Some more. 
powerhouse. I mean, but um, I'm a storyteller. It's the type of stories I like to tell. A lot of people uh, was like, oh, you got stories like Richard Price. So I studied a lot of Richard Price. Mm. Uh, Bill Cosby, great storyteller. Chris Rock is too. And we can't take away from Bill Cosby because of what's, what, what has happened. Bill I Cosby, think you can't talented. take away from the talent. It's unfortunate the situation. Unfortunately, he's creepy. Ugh. But uh, <laughs> but but you did do some great work work for it. Like I even look at like I, I talked about this with I think uh, Alex Thomas we were talking about earlier with, with uh, Mike Mike Vick when it came to like the, the Mike Vick. I'm with a big the, Michael Vick fan. With the dogs and yeah. stuff, and it's like, or even like an OJ Simpson, you want to. Uh, Maybe a bad uh, <laughs> example, but you want to strip them of what they've done, but you can't strip them of what they've done because of the mistakes they've made. Well, can we? Uh, you can't strip them. It's gonna always be there. Yeah. Michael Vick is uh, Atlanta is always gonna love him. Mm-hmm. OJ Simpson is always gonna be the Jews. Mm-hmm. But he killed. He, he he did some crazy shit. <laughs> Bill Cosby was always gonna. Be one of the greatest comedians that ever lived, but behind closed doors, he was a Bill Cosby that yeah. didn't know about. He had a he had a sickness, so I don't think nobody would ever not say he wasn't a great comedian. Mm-hmm. Now, what might be more forward is he was a fucking creepy comedian. The things that he did, mm-hmm. you know, you can't violate people and then want to have this smile on your face and act like you're something else. It's so hard to fucking yeah. rape this. Because I know I grew up on, definitely on Cosby Show. Like you said, it was different examples. Uh, Joan Cleaver and stuff. Yeah. Cosby Show was one of those for me where it's like, oh, okay, well, not that I grew up in like the situations that you grew up in, but it, it also taught me that I can dream bigger than where I'm, than where I'm at. And when you see, like you said, you're, when you see success in a different way, especially of people of your color. Mm-hmm. So... I'm just, it's unfortunate, but hopefully they'll put his, his stuff back on television. <laughs> Not with today's, with today's, uh, <laughs> with today's world. Um, but we said black, black, black girl magic, black girls, black girl rock. You said you just waiting for your, for, for the, the, the big black girl movement to, to, ha- <laughs> to happen and go all the way through. You, you see it, it's a, a, quite a few different big black beautiful women coming out. Was there ever a time that you feel any body shame images in Hollywood or? I don't know shit about Hollywood. I live in the Midwest. Everybody's shaped like me. <laughs> we go to the Walmart with no bra on. People put their bra on at six o'clock in the morning. What do you mean body shame? I don't know about no body shame. Hey, when I'm, I, I don't walk around in my neighborhood with this wig and makeup on. Uh-huh. I don't give a fuck. You, you worry about body shaming, you care about what people think about you. Mm-hmm. Nobody has to pull my stomach back but my husband. <laughs> I'm not worry about what the fuck. I don't sleep with you. You don't feed me. Wow, okay. So, no, I don't care about no body shaming. Now, I'm not going to run outside in a two-piece bathing suit. I know I ain't got that shit. I know a third grade figure is gone. But I, I don't know nothing about that. I don't get caught up in this bullshit. Mm. I don't get, you know, and I won't get caught up in this I'm not gossiping about celebrities. I don't know no fucking celebrity. I'd rather be around a normal person like you. I don't have time for this shit. Okay. I'm grown. I'm a grown ass woman. Yeah, I don't yeah. need to party with nobody. I need to be at home watching my Netflix. Not <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the kids. <laughs> <laughs> I went to the NAACP and they like, walk the red carpet. I was like, get the fuck away from me. You walk the red carpet. I'm going to sit my ass down so I can get my chicken. My feet hurt. <laughs> I go like, walk the red car. I said, you walk the fucking red car. You look just like me, motherfucker. Yes. You walk it. They don't know who I am, yes. and they ain't going to know who the hell you is. Set your ass down somewhere. What would Miss Pat today say to the teenage Miss Rabbit? The teenage who? To, to Miss to, to Rabbit. Rabbit. Who would, today, uh-huh. what would you say to her looking forward towards the future? Bitch, we made <laughs> you gonna be all right. We gonna be all right. Yeah. <laughs> we got health care. <laughs> gonna get these back teeth fixed, and we almost there. <laughs> well, you know, I would honestly, I would say, you know, we found what we were searching for, which was love, and we all right. Thank you for sitting with me.
Thank you for having me. I, I think I was used to, used to you as my uh, Ayala Fix My Life type situation. Miss <laughs> 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 Pat, you guys. <laughs> Comedy ice.